All right, so we are, we've covered like collisions and things like that. We are going to talk about potential energy. We got a little demo for you. So this is like a momentum demo mm. on that. Basically, you know, how I can third law a target that's provided itself. <laughs> Guys like to move right in front of right right in front of targets. So if I take this, well, let me do that. <laughs> so you can see. Can you do it again? Let me see it. All right. Small impulse. I'm taking basically very small impulse time from the back of the room. I'm putting a dent in the cardboard. I'm gonna do the cardboard on that. No boy. No boy. Try to hit that back. No, hey, you try to hit one of them. Hey, shoot me from here. I'll catch you. You would. Hey, shoot me. Come on over there. Hey, you can give yourself up something. This uh, it hurts. I don't care. What are you trying to hit? Oh, okay. You gotta tell us what you're trying to hit. Try to hit the cardboard box. All right, all right. Last try. Last try. Last try. Last try. Last try. If you are close enough to it, point five just. Nice. Oh. It's cardboard. That's not impressive. Oh, you got hit by that. It would hurt. But you gotta figure. I'm down. If I if I put a point on that, I mean that that went through just a blunt point. I mean, it's just a just a dry erase marker. Jimmy, what point? But if I put a point on it. Come on. <laughs> You know, imagine what that would do. I want to find out. Without the point. I'm down to this, this is a don't do this at home sort of thing. That's why we do it at school. <laughs> <laughs> that wouldn't make yourself a target. Like I said, it would hurt. All right, so we're talking about energy. We need to finish up about energy here. Energy. And remember, if you, one thing, if you missed the project, testing the project. I know I asked some of you to come in last time. Obviously, I wasn't here. Um, you know, but Monday, zero period, is time to come in and test it if you missed the project. I don't think there's only a couple people in here. A lot, most of them are seventh period. But there were a couple people. So Monday, zero period. There, there is a first period class here. Not mine, but there is a first period class. So we can't do it during first. Plus a number of people do have first periods. So we're going to talk about mechanical energy. We have already talked about one type of mechanical energy. Anybody remember what that was? What type of mechanical energy have we already talked about? Starts with W. Work. And we already talked about work. Their work is force times distance. Ability to do work. That's what energy is called. So the next we want to talk about two others, potential and kinetic. But we talk about gravitational potential energy. Our symbol we use PE. Now there are other types of potential energy, Jimmy. There are other types of potential energy. I mean, I can show you some potential energy right here. That's potential energy. This is chemical potential energy because the sugars and fats in this piece of candy, when you eat it, is the energy that your body uses to move. So that's also a type of potential energy. But we're talking about gravitational potential energy. Yes, sir. So we write these notes with uh, lecture notes? This is lecture notes. This is the last part of our lecture notes. Measured in joules is all other energy. Is, is the energy of position, height. In other words, I take this little box, I move it up. You know, what kind of energy am I doing on this? I'm doing work. 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 I'm doing work. Well, energy has to go somewhere. I do work and it goes up there. So that work I did on it, well, that's energy. That energy has to go somewhere and it becomes potential energy. Notice I have a certain distance above the ground because if it fell off, the earth, the gravitational force of the earth is going to pull it down. It's going to do work on this object. It's the potential to do work. I mean, that's what we're talking about, the potential to do work. So because gravity is going to pull it down, it's going to do work on it, on that. And it's stored energy. It is stored energy on that. Anyone need more time? Good? Take some good 
class, we can see where we're going. How long is it for you? No. Actually, bringing it on that, bringing it on campus could get you expelled. Eureka! The story so far. Things which are moving have the ability to do work and to apply a force to a distance. They can be said to have work in them. Another word for work in is energy. Since energy is simply the ability to do work, and since work is measured in joules, energy is also measured in joules. The energy of movement is called kinetic energy. And now, potential energy. Once upon a time, a very small man had to do battle with a very large giant. The only thing that the small man had going for him was his sling. When you get loose with it, the mass of the stone combined with its speed to give it kinetic energy with which it was able to do work on the giant, thereby applying force and exerting that force through a distance. The stone had energy thanks to its movement. Indeed, everything that moves has energy, even the air around us. Once air is moving, it has the energy to drive windmills. Just as when water is moving, it has the energy to drive water mills. But if every moving thing has kinetic energy, does that mean that things which aren't moving don't have energy? In that case, why are you staring up at that rock perched on the edge of the cliff? Why be frightened of it? It can't have any kinetic energy because it's not moving. And if it hasn't any kinetic energy, it can't do any work new, can it? But maybe you better move out of the way all the same. Why? Because of the rock's position on the edge of the cliff. It hasn't any movement so far, but it looks as if it's on the point of having quite a lot of movement any minute now. Because the force of gravity wants very much to make it fall off the cliff. That means that in a sense, the rock has a lot of energy stored up in it. A lot of what scientists call potential energy or the energy of position the slightest puff of wind and that potential energy will immediately start being transformed into kinetic energy that's how the energy of position becomes the energy of movement oh, oh don't look now but it's time to use some more kinetic energy to do some more work on that giant again in slow motion. The stone lost more and more speed as it left your sling because of the force of gravity trying to pull it down. The higher it got, the slower it went, and the less kinetic energy it had. Until at last it came to a complete stop and had no kinetic energy left in it at all, and therefore no work in it, and no force that it could exert on the giant. <laughs> But where did all that kinetic energy go? Is it lost forever? No. It's being transformed into potential energy. The work that the little man put into slinging the stone is now stored up in the stone. But of course, in reality, the stone only stops for a split second and then immediately starts coming down again until it has got back all the kinetic energy that it had in the first place. Meanwhile, back at the cliff edge, the giant finds all this very amusing, but he'd better watch out, because most of the kinetic energy it took for him to climb up to the top of the cliff is now stored in him by virtue of his position. He's full of potential energy, just waiting to be converted back into kinetic energy any minute now. Mm-hmm. <laughs> 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 <laughs>
All right. So, the thing about potential energy, it doesn't matter the path, how you got there. Strictly about how high you are on that. And kind of makes sense because when we deal with simple machines, whether I lift it straight up or I went up the ramp, does that do anything to the work that I do? No, I may spread the work out, but it does nothing about the work. Whether I lift it straight up the two meters, I get 200 joules. I go up the ramp, I'm still gonna have 200 joules of potential energy because remember, whether I lift it straight up or I go up the ramp, the amount of work I'm doing is going to be the same. Kind of goes that simple machine sort of thing, goes along with that, whatever I do. So it doesn't matter the path, it's strictly about how far you are above the ground, which means potential energy is equal to the mass of the object times the acceleration of gravity times the height. In other words, potential energy equals mgh. Now I want you to remember from the last unit, mass times acceleration of gravity. What do we call that? What, there is a word we use for that. It's also a W word. Mass times the acceleration of gravity as an object's what? Weight. It's just weight. Weight is a partial F force. So I have a force times a distance. That sounds a lot like what? Force times distance, what do we call that? We call that work. Yeah, we call that work. So we can say that work equals potential energy. In other words, F D equals MGH. Because we said, when I lift this box, I'm doing work. And that work becomes potential energy in the box. There, it's the potential to do work. And that work, when we drop it, when it comes back down, that work is going to be converted into another type of energy. And we need more time. So where is that energy going? Well, it becomes kinetic energy. As our thing is moving down, it becomes kinetic energy on that. Our kinetic energy, our symbol is Ke. Our unit is still the joule. joule. And this is the energy of motion. Energy of motion. Moving objects have kinetic energy. We saw this back when we were talking about collisions, remember? In our Newton's cradle, when it hits, it's, it's transferring the momentum and the kinetic energy from, from object to object. And this is the energy of a moving object, the energy that transfers to other objects during a collision. You know, this is the whole idea between, you know, military weapons. How much kinetic energy? You know, why did the military go from a very a 30 caliber bullet during World War II to a 22 caliber bullet in Vietnam and ever since? Well, because they're getting as much, if not more, kinetic energy because of other factors. They can get as much impact with a lighter something that's lighter, and we'll talk a little bit about that. Anyone need more time? something through a distance, work is done. Work is measured in joules. One joule is the amount of work done when one newton of force is applied through a distance of one meter. And now, kinetic energy. Because of inertia or laziness, this billiard ball doesn't want to move. In fact, it would sit there all day minding its own business if another ball were not to come along and knock it into the pocket. Because the second ball forces the first one to move.
So when you have a force acting through a distance, you know that some work has been done. Fine. But where did this work come from? The second billiard ball, naturally. But what's so special about this ball that enables it to push the other one around? They both have the same mass, don't they? And they're both being pulled down to Earth by exactly the same force of gravity. So what did the second ball have that the first ball didn't? Movement. It was moving and the other one wasn't. And when you have both mass and speed, you have the ability to do work. You can use your movement to get other things to move. In a sense, you have work in you. Physicists, keen as ever on borrowing words from other languages, went this time to Greek and found that the Greek word for in is en, and that the word for work is ergon. When you put en and ergon together, you get energon, which comes out as the English word energy. And the physicists agree to use this word to mean the ability to do work. So the moving billiard ball has energy. The origin of this energy was, of course, the billiard player, whose arm had work in it, or energy, because of its movement. This energy was transferred to the cue when the arm made the cue move, which in turn transferred the energy to the billiard ball by making it move, and hit the other ball, forcing it to move into the billiard table pocket. In each case, a number of joules of work were done. Arm moving cue, cue moving ball, ball moving ball. But since work is merely energy in action, and there's no work possible without energy, we might as well say that a number of joules of energy were expended each time. And that's exactly what we do say. Both work and energy are measured in joules. Think of joules being transferred from an energy box to a work box, or then to a force times distance box. Joules of energy are spent not only by billiard players, but by hockey players and soccer players, carpenters and ditch diggers. And all the energy to do all this work is only made possible by movement. So that they wouldn't forget this, the physicists went once again to their Greek dictionaries and found that the Greek for movement is kinema, a word that film producers have also borrowed to mean moving pictures or cinema. But the physicists decided to keep the K and to call the energy of movement kinetic energy. All right, so kinetic energy, the energy of movement. And so kinetic energy, we grab this out, blah, blah, blah. Kinetic energy is equal to one half times the mass of the object times its velocity squared. In other words, Ke equals one half mv. Where? So, if I wanted to increase my kinetic energy, I could do it by two ways. I can increase the mass, and keeping my speed constant, or I can change the velocity and keep the mass constant. And in that, there is a little history. History of ships like that. You know, so, in the history of naval warfare, you know, they started mounting guns to ships probably around the time of the Renaissance when they started putting cannons on ships. For that, basically, you would run your ship up alongside the other one, you lower a ramp, and your troops would go run on their ship, you'd ram them, things like this. This is why the forecastle, which is the port, front part of the ship, the forecastle, started the word originally was forecastle. It really was built up like a castle. You know, it's basically the land warfare on ships. Then they start cannon. So gunpowder didn't improve. So the velocity of shells wasn't that 
much different, no matter how big your cannon was. So the only way to get more kinetic energy, and remember, how do you sink another ship? Especially if it's made out of wood in the beginning, by punching holes through it, which means bigger, lots of kinetic energy. So the only way to get bigger kinetic energy was to put bigger shells. If you start ships got were getting bigger, bigger guns. Eventually you had these very large guns, but even then you get in the time of the Virginia and the Monitor in their battle, the first battle of ironclads, got to a point where finally they put armor on ships. The Monitor and the Virginia fired at point blank range at each other. In other words, they were basically cannons, like right here's the wall, here's the cannon. They shot far, right there and still didn't put a hole through them. So again, we start getting bigger, bigger shells, bigger things. But again, the velocity's not changing too much. Then we get into the time of, you know, you start getting breech loading guns and battleships, the big gun battleships, things like that, they're growing and growing. Bigger guns meant bigger masses, more throwaway. Ends in that. Missouri was the epitome of battleship design. The velocities of the shells hadn't changed much. Whether you're talking about 15 inch gun, 14 inch gun, blah, blah, blah. They all ran about the same speed. The only way you could get more punching power is to make them bigger. These ships get massive. I mean, you guys don't see it. That ship is three football fields long. The ship is almost 900 feet long. So how over, uh, it's over 100 feet wide. You see 16 feet above the water, it extends another 36 feet below the water. 1,600 man crew. A lot of people. Big ships. But the thing is, now aboard a ship, big bullets. I mean, we fired shells that were about this tall, about this big around. We carried about 1,600 rounds on board ships. So a big ship, lots of rounds. After World War II, battleships passe, more the aircraft, things like that. The guns got smaller but faster. But there's another type of battleship, one that's used on land. You may know what we call that? Tank. Now, the first tanks, World War I, when the first tanks came in, you guys saw, I think, they, didn't they show that in the wheel? No, that's a different one. Different video. Um, so, smaller guns, and again, the guns start getting bigger, the tanks are bigger. Now, trouble on land, now a big ship like this Lots of, is there lots of space there to hold lots of shells? Yeah. yeah, I mean, we carried a lot of shells. You know, even five inch guns, we carried like 6,000 rounds of five inch. Five inch ammunition, about like that. So, a lot of shells. But a tank, as the gun, you know, if I need more throw weight, my gun's getting bigger and bigger, the shells are getting bigger and bigger, I can't make my tank all that much bigger. One, the bigger the tank is, the bigger a target it is. You know, on that. Can't put as much armor. Germans built this great tank during World War II. Big gun, lots of armor, couldn't be hurt, but so big and heavy it could barely move. Barely move. Not good. So again, after World War II, chemistry comes along, we get better gunpowder. So now instead of making having so now our shells can move faster. Yeah, it's our rifle during during World War II. I mean just the rifle itself that the soldiers carry was 13 and a half pounds. That's without the ammunition in it. 13 and a half pounds of misery, believe me. Doesn't sound like a lot, but when you have to carry that all the time, believe me, after about 30 minutes of drill, just with that rifle, because this rifle we use for drill at the academy, you were hating life. You know, you really were hating life because you had to carry this stupid thing around. I can't imagine carrying around day after day. So even the military is looking for a better thing. So that's why we use this an M16 now. We go from a bullet that's that long to a bullet that's about that long. But you say, well, how does that do the same thing? Well, because we didn't make the math, the mass bigger, now we want to make the velocity greater. Because if I if by changing the velocity, I get a greater change because velocity is what? Squared. Because if I double the mass, I get for the same velocity, I get double the kinetic energy. But if I double my velocity for the same mass, I'm going to get four times, right? Because it's two squared, two squared, four times, four times the energy. And that's what happened. That little 22 bullet that the M16 fires is much faster than that 30 caliber bullet that the M1 Garands fired during World War I. A lot more kinetic energy, a lot more energy out of the rifle. And if your tank, if I can use a smaller gun on my tank to get the same thing, how many more shells can I carry on my tank? A lot more. 
Because believe me, if you're in the middle of a, of a fight and you run out shells, it really, really stinks. You know, that's a really bad feeling when you shove the last bullet into the barrel and on that. And even now, a lot of the bullets, the anti-tank rounds the tanks fire actually don't have explosive in them. It's just this rod. It's this very heavy rod, has a lot of kinetic energy, goes very fast, it just punches a hole right through the other tank, kind of rattles around on the inside. You know, the thing about it, you shove something through and it kind of rattles around like a can on the inside, going very fast, bad things are going to happen for the people and equipment inside the tank. Okay? So on that. But this is why our velocity, and we're going to see that in some of our those concept builders. Questions? So the work energy theorem. So remember, work. How do I get kinetic energy? I have to do work. So work equals a change in kinetic energy. Any work I do on something, like that box, remember the box here, if I drop it, the earth is going to do work on it. It's going to do work on it, and it's going to come down, it's going to cause a change in kinetic energy, make it speed up, which means my Ke at the end minus Ke at the start. Remember, that's what delta means on that. You know, that's what delta means. What that tells us, though, remember, I have potential energy, like when I put the box up here, and it can become kinetic energy. There's work in between. Now, as we get into conservation of energy, always remember, I do work. The work is converted to potential energy. That potential energy is then, when I drop it, is converted to kinetic energy. But remember, the Earth has to do work on it that potential energy goes into work, which becomes kinetic energy. Even though we will say, in the book probably said, potential energy becomes kinetic, kinetic energy becomes potential. To go from here to there, I first have to do some work. The kinetic gets converted to work, gets converted to potential. Potential gets converted to work, goes kinetic. Although we don't say it, that's always happening. But they're all the same. Potential energy equals work equals kinetic energy. All right, anyone need more time? Which leads us to conservation of energy. Now, even though this is our second conservation law we've talked about, this is rule number one. Now, this is our general statement of conservation of energy. Energy cannot be created nor destroyed, but only converted from one form to another. All right, so we can't create energy, we can't destroy energy, only goes from one form to another. Does that necessarily mean we can use the energy? No. And when we get to chapter 24, we're going to learn about something called entropy. entropy. Which will tell, you know, the unusable energy. On that. The energy is there, we just can't use it anymore. But remember, we're not talking about energy in general. Now, this is our general statement. We are talking about cons con me, mechanical energy specifically. Anyone need more time? Which says the conservation of mechanical energy says that the total mechanical energy in a system must remain constant. And the total mechanical energy is the sum of the potential and kinetic energy of the object on that. So that what we say is the potential energy at the beginning plus the kinetic energy at the beginning has to equal the potential plus the kinetic at the end. So the sum at the beginning has to equal the sum at the end and the sum at any time in between. So we're looking at this. So the book. So here I have a certain I have this object at the top, like our little person at the top. And when they at the top, they're not moving, but they have all this potential energy. And so the total energy of their system, the total energy here is 10,000 joules, which means 
as this thing falls. So if this had 10,000 joules at the top, as it falls, the total energy must always be what? 10,000. At all times, it must be 10,000. Notice, we get a quarter of the way down. Now, our potential is the 7,500. We've lost a quarter of our potential energy because we've lost a quarter of our height. Our potential energy is on height. But our kinetic has gone up 2,500. It still equals 10,000. Our total is still 10,000. Halfway down, we've lost half the potential, but it's been gained as kinetic. It's still 10,000 joules. Three quarters of the way down, we've lost three quarters of potential energy, but it's convert for converted to kinetic, still 10,000 joules. Then we get to the bottom, it's all kinetic. All, no potential, it's all kinetic. Now when she hits the thing, where's that energy going? Well, it goes to other kinds of energy. It's not lost, it just goes to other places. Heat, light, sound, other things on that. Another example is our pendulum is the perfect example of conservation energy. Because when I have it up here, all the energy is potential, I'm at my highest point. As it goes down, that the Earth is doing work on this object, and that work is being converted to kinetic. We get to the bottom, its lowest point, all the potential is being converted to kinetic. Now as we go up, that kinetic basically is doing work on is doing work to go up, and so that work is being converted to potential, and so it becomes potential at the top again, and it keeps working back and forth. So it's constantly being converted from potential to kinetic back to potential as it moves back and forth like that. All right, so even in our little spring here, right, I put 10 joules of potential energy joules of potential energy into the spring on that. Right? I have some mechanical potential energy. Now I got eight out. You might say, well, I lost some. But notice I got two joules of heat. I got two joules of heat. So what was the total out? Still 10. Still 10. Okay. 10 in, 10 out. Again, it might not be useful on that, but it's 10 in, 10 out. All right? And we actually have a video about that. Not Eureka. Uh, do you trust science? Of course you do. You trust gravity to stick you to the ground. You trust friction to stop your car. You trust that E equals MC squared because, well, I don't know, it just does. But do you fully trust science? Enough to risk getting your face smashed in? Ed does, because Ed believes in the conservation of energy. And that's basically a fancy phrase that means, essentially, if I hold this iron and hold it up next to Ed's face and let go, it won't swing back and belt him one. That's right, isn't it, Ed? I hope so. Okay, well, let's see. Now, the reason Ed's still got a face is because the iron won't swing back even as far as the point where it started. And that's because of friction acting up here and air resistance on the iron itself as it moves through the air. But what if we make the weight a lot heavier and the swingy bit a lot longer? I wonder. Heavier and longer. Well, a hundred foot crane would be a start. And then something heavy to hang off the end. Like this big lump of concrete, maybe. It worked on a small scale, so will it work like this? Right, well we're all set to go. Three, two, one. his teeth. Right, that all works fine. If we release the rock from just in front of Ed's face, it can't swing back and give him a smack. But let's try something a bit more risky. When we set the rock off from over there, it swung to a point in there over here. And if we can work out where that point is, 
then we should be able to release the rock, and if we've worked it out properly, it should stop just short of Ed's face. It should. <laughs> now we're moving a little bit into the realms of the unknown. We have to make sure all calculations are correct, because the rock isn't going to obliterate Ed's Oxford-educated brain. Actually, I've got a thought. There's no point in making it, if we do it precisely equidistant, we can go closer, because when we release it, no, no, because when we release it, that's the whole point of it. When we release, there's friction at the top and there's wind resistance on the rock and it goes through the air. And it'll fall short. Because it's coming from there, it'll, it won't go that far. So we can afford to go closer. I don't know by how much. It can go a bit, and then that's when we can start just testing. <laughs> Right, here's how we're going to do it. We'll release it from that end. It'll go, obviously, swing towards the tower, and somebody's got to get a measure by eye of where it, it would end. First, a test run with a mannequin. Oh, yeah. yeah. You reckon it's on the bar? Okay. Okay, good luck, mannequin. Did you notice what the person did? Ooh, that could have been me. Back to the drawing board. Rough guesses are probably not what we're after right now. By, by the way, did you notice what the person did when they released it? Yeah, they pushed it a little bit. They pushed it. They didn't let go. They pushed it. So they gave extra force into it, which is why it swung farther and hit them. Okay. <laughs> Or it's going to be big plastic surgery bills for Ed. <laughs> Releasing the rock from a slightly lower position should do, and with no pushing. The moment has arrived. Time to strap Ed down, put away the calculators, and give it a go. Ready? <laughs> Okay, so we can see conservation of energy there at work on that. All right, so we're going to practice a few things. So let's get out Concept Builder 7.1. We're looking at the back, and I want you guys to work on, remember, we're using these as notes, so we're not doing everything. We're only doing selected parts. So I want you guys to do the back side of this. Read through the directions. This is a mo conservation of momentum problem, might, like what you might see on the test. So you're going to work through this. So work through our Granny Ambrose problem. You guys can work together on it, and that's fine. So I'll give you a few minutes to work this out together. you got to think about what kind of collision this is. Is it a totally elastic or totally inelastic collision and go from there? totally inelastic collision. But we have to deal with what's happening before. Now before she runs, she picks up Ambrose. Granny has a mass of 80 kilograms. Her speed is three meters per second. Remember, momentum is mass times velocity. So her momentum is three times 80 or 240 kilogram meters per second. Ambrose is not moving. His momentum is zero which means the total momentum of the Granny Ambrose system is 240 kilogram meters per second, which means what has the total to be after the collision? 240. Whatever it was before has to be the same as after. Anyone need more time? So if we answer this, after the collision, is Granny's speed going to go up or go down? It's going to go down, right? After the collision, is Ambrose's speed going to increase or decrease? It's going to increase. Increase. That makes sense, right? Because Granny is picking up Ambrose. She get, gains more mass. She's going to slow down. He gets picked up. He's going to speed up. He was going zero before. Now, after the cl collision, what is the total mass of the Granny Ambrose system? 120, right? It's her 80 plus his 40 or 120 kilograms. After the collision was the total momentum. 240. It's still 240 is whatever it was before is still the same at the end. Whatever it was before has to be the same. 
using conservation momentum. Now remember, M1, V1, which would be, let's call that a G. Not momentum of Granny, plus the momentum of Ambrose has to equal the mass of Granny and Ambrose times their velocity of Granny and Ambrose together, right? This is a totally elastic collision. Well, we know what this is. That's 240. We know what the mass is, is 120 kilograms times the V. By both sides by 120. I get their velocity is now 2 meters per second. Which makes sense, right? Granny, the mass, the thing about Granny, Granny's mass went up by a third because she picked up Ambrose. Her speed has to go down by a third. That's what happened. Any questions on that? Good thing for no card to have the formulas, right? No cards. Have those formulas. All right, let's get out 8 1. We're going to look at this. This simple machine type of thing. And what did you guys find out in your lab? I'm still grading through the labs. Unfortunately, I couldn't grade them while I was sick. It was hard to grade. Which machine? Pulleys, levers? Which one did you get? How many have got the. Well, how many got any kind of play as being the most efficient? That's good. How many got pulley as being most efficient? How many have got the lever as being most efficient? Were the lever and the pulley pretty close? Yeah, yeah. yeah they're pretty close because, again, it's that point. Remember the video showed you already got all this friction from the inclined plane. The pulley and the and you know pulley and the lever have just that one little point. So depending on how accurate you are, it could go either. They're just, both of them should have been pretty close. Should have both been pretty close. By the way, is there a problem with the lever? And that's what. Uh, is the weight even? No, because the mechanical advantage where you're pulling, you know, it has to do with what the weight is. It should cancel, but there might be some issues with the bar. Since we put the bar in the middle, it should be. But you notice it doesn't balance right before you start out. It doesn't have to do with the with the meter stick, right? When you held the meter stick. It's actually not the meter stick that's a problem because we have the meter stick balanced in the middle. It's the what? The little. It's the clips. The clips actually give you more weight and they're not balanced, so we get some on that. So it can throw off your lever a bit on that. So here we have an inclined plane and we're assuming basically no friction. That's, and by using ice, that's pretty close because ice on a, on a surface is pretty non-frictional. What is the mechanical advantage? Well, in cases they're giving us distances, this would be our theoretical mechanical advantage, right? which would be the effort, this is our effort, this is our load, that's our effort distance over the load distance, or six meters over three meters, or two, which is a two to one mechanical advantage. This is basically what you did in your lab. I mean, I set all of them to be a two to one mechanical advantage, for theoretical. How much force do you need to push it? Well, if our thing weighs 500 newtons, in other words, I would have to lift with 500 newtons straight up, how much am I going to have to push on it to get it go up? 250, right? Twice the distance, half the force. All right, Remember, that's how that works. Remember the work. And what can we say about work? Work has to be the same. Work has to be the same. Questions? Any questions on that? All right. So this one, read through this. Work together, read through the directions carefully. Think about what you've learned before about things falling and how long it takes them to fall and things like that and answer those questions. I'll give you about a couple of minutes to read through it. Think about what you've learned before. Let's take a look at this. So we wanna know how fast. Now, what can I say I have at this block at the top. I have some potential energy at the top of each one of these when the block is at the top. What can I say about those three potential energies? They're the same, right? Because they are all five meters above. Now, the bottom, when it falls off the top, it falls straight down. It falls to five meters. How long does it take to fall five meters? 
What? Memory four it takes one second to fall five meters. Right after one second of free fall, we will fall five meters. So conversely, to fall five meters takes one second. There. So those things we learned before still come around. Might be a good thing for a note card. You know, how far do I fall in a certain amount of time? All right, so I know that after one second, well, if I fall one second and my acceleration is 10 meters per second squared, how fast am I going after one second of free fall? 10 meters per second. 10 meters per second. Now, the other ones, though, I'm going down the ramp. Well, just like it doesn't matter the route I take to get up, doesn't matter the route I take to get down. In other words, this one has some kinetic energy, and this one has some kinetic energy, and this one has some kinetic energy. What can I say about those three kinetic energies? They're all the same, right? Potential energy at the top has to equal the kinetic energy at the bottom. Now, since the mass of all three boxes is the same, right? Same box, same box. What can we say about the speed of the box at the end of the ramp? They're all the same. The route does not matter. They're the same. Now, are they all going to get to the bottom at the same time? No. No. Right? No. Because it's going to take longer, just like there's, less, there's more force here, uh, more gravitational force here than here, it's going to take longer to get there. But by the time you get to the bottom, you're still there. Okay? So the rules, the route doesn't matter for potential. It doesn't matter for kinetic either. Which leads us to this one. Which box is going to get to the bottom fastest? Box A. A is going to get there faster. But what is their speed going to be at the bottom? The same velocity. Same V. A will get the A will get there first because steeper hill, faster acceleration. But they both will have the same speed at the bottom. Alright? Just takes longer. Yes, sir. Question. So it's gonna be at the bottom. A and B A A and B will have the same speed at the bottom, but A will get to the bottom first. You know, it makes sense. If I was on a bicycle, if two bicycle riders left at the top of these two hills, which one would get to the bottom first? Hey, well, I don't know. I see. I just watch guys in steels like this right now. You know, but. All right. So this one. Let's take a bit. Fill in the spots. Think about what it's asking you and fill in the spots. Okay. So what is the total mechanical energy of this system? Seventy-five. How do you know it's seventy-five? Because the bottom, right? They gave you both values. Seventy-five plus zero. So the total is seventy-five. So throughout this, it should that needs to be 75, which means what is the potential energy at the top? 75 joules. Good merit. It always has to equal 75. Here, the kinetic energy is 25. Because they have to add up to 75. Here, the potential energy is 25. Okay, good. Good. So, now, this roller coaster. Read it carefully. Think about what it's asking. Again, think about the values that are being given. Answer the questions. Answer these questions. You may work there. Work with your partners. So, we have the speed, friction free wire. So it goes from A to B. What is its speed when it gets to B? How much? 10 meters per second. How do we know it's 10 meters per second? Well, no, it doesn't take one second to fall five meters. Remember, it's at an angle, but we know that by the time it goes down this five meters, it will have to get up to 10 meters per second. If it fell straight down, yes, that'd be one second. But remember, this path matter. As long as you fall five meters on this frictionless surface, by the time I get to the bottom of that five meter vertical, I will have a speed of 10 meters per second. So on that. So it will take more than one second though, because it's not straight. All right, but it is 10 meters. Now it's going to go down to C, and it's going to come back up. When it gets back to D, it's going to be at 10 meters, 10 meters per second. When it goes up, it's going to come back down. And you can see it's going to be at 
10 meters per second. Notice D, D, and E are all at the same level. They're all 10 meters per second. Now, where is it going to be going fastest? The letter C. Right? Because when we got the B, but still going down. Still going down, right? So what's happening with speed? It's still going up. We don't know what the value is for C because we don't know what distance it is down. But we do know that's maximum thing. Now once it passes C though, that kinetic is we're at max kinetic energy, right? Max potential, max kinetic. Now some of that kinetic is being converted back into potential, so then when it gets to here, we're back at the 10. We have, but we have some potential. Now it's still going up, and so we're getting to some potential. Does it still have some kinetic, it, kinetic here? Yeah. yeah, because this is where zero, poten zero kinetic was at the top. So we have some kinetic. But then it starts going down, some of that potential we gain back is being converted back to kinetic, and we get to here, we're going to have that. And this is kind of how roller coasters are designed. Now, real roller coasters have friction, right? Yeah. The idea is they design the friction in, into the roller coaster that by the time when you get close to the end, you don't have to brake, or you have a minimal amount of braking. Because if you are right here and you had to brake, what's that going to feel like? Oh, That's going to hurt. Can they stop the roller coaster right here? Yeah. They have to. It's not fun. Because they do can brake it at any point. I mean, there's places where they have brakes, but they don't do that. And there are places on real roller coasters they sometimes slow down. But for the most part, a roller coaster is designed so that when, by the time you get to the end, you pretty much used up all your speed on that. Especially, you get that more on, on like wooden roller coasters, because you see that more on that type. All right, so we're going to go to 8.2. So we're on the front side of 8.2, we're going through a variety of these things. So, right here, potential energy of 10 to the fourth joules when it's up, how much work is going to be done on the pay? 10 to the fourth joules. Remember, some of this kinetic, this is being converted to kinetic energy, but when it gets the pylon, all that kinetic energy that it gained as it fell is going to get converted to work. And this is how a pile driver works. And around here, you see pile drivers a lot because we live with the mud. You know, a lot of these buildings are built on mud, so they have to drive piles, big cement columns, down to the bedrock. So that, because if they don't do that, the building would sink. So on this one, fill in the fill in the values. Fill in the values. I'll give you a minute to fill in those values. Any less than. Okay. So this middle one. What is the potential energy at the top? Thirty. How do we know that? Yeah, it's, it's at the same height, right? Did it matter that it went up the ramp? No. No. What about this one? We go up three steps. What's thirty? What about two steps? 20, right? We've only done 20 because we're only two-thirds of the way up. So we know that if the top is 30, this one would be 10. Now when this one falls up, the kinetic energy is going to be 30 joules. Okay, conservation, conservation on that. Okay, we, we've done this one already. Now let's look at this. This one can be confusing, all right? Okay. All right, Shh. what this is telling me, one half times whatever the mass of the car is times 30 kilometers per hour squared is 10 to the 6 joules. That's what the first one's telling me. I mean, that's how I would figure that. So I know that this right here equals 10 to the 6 joules. Now, if I have 60 kilometers per hour, All right, and I want to know how much kinetic energy it is. But I think, well, I still I don't know the mass. But what about this? Can I do that? Can I do that? Yes. So that becomes one half mass times thirty squared times two squared. But what do we know about that? What do we know about one half? Mass times 30 squared. What does that equal? 
that equals 10 to the 6 joules. This is 10 to the 6 joules times 4. So I get 4 times 10 to the 6 joules. Notice I doubled my velocity. I get 4 times the energy. Or that's what we said before. You get the, num the increase squared. Which means since here I tripled my velocity, how much more how much more energy should I get? I have three times the energy I should get. What's three squared? Nine. Nine. I should get nine times ten to the sixth joule. So if I go at one half mass times ninety squared, again that's one half times mass times three times thirty squared. So my one half mass times thirty squared times three squared. 10 to the 6 times 9. All right, if it was 4, if I was going 120, that would be 4 times the velocity. So it would be 4 times the velocity, how many times more energy? 4 times the velocity would give me how many times more energy? What? 16, right? 4 squared. If it was 5 times the velocity, I'd have 25 times the energy. Remember, we square the velocity. But the increase is the square of the increase, right? Two squared, three squared, so on. Okay, on that. All right, we've talked about that one already. So let's look at the back side. You guys, right now, fill in all the questions on the back side. We'll take about three, four minutes. Fill in all that back side, please. Fill in the whole back side. Look at these. So first of all, so remember, the weight, the load is 100 newtons on our fixed pulley. Does a fixed pulley change the amount of force? No, it only changes the direction, right? The load goes up, she pulls down, but she's still pulling down with 100 newtons of force, which biomechanically is easier for us. So remember, there is an advantage. You don't get the advantage from the, the pulley, but you do get an advantage from your body. Your body does have a mechanical advantage pulling down. In your lab, though, here you had 100 newtons, and you found that how much force did it take to lift up? You had a 10 newton weight, and you only had to use 5 to get it up. We used half, 50 newtons, because we had 2. You have 2 touching. So she only needs to have to use 50 newtons. Now, when I have my compound pulley, the compound pulley, which has both in there, she's still going to pull down with 50. Yeah, because it's only those two that are supporting. Those are the only two we consider for supporting. This one is just an extension of the last line. Yes, sir? So the one in the middle is 50 because of the well, no, it's 50 because we have two lines attached to it. It's kind of like Nellie Newton. Remember, Nellie Newton was on the trapeze here. There, she was on the trapeze like that. And she weighed, she was 100 Newtons. Each one is going to hold 50. Basically, this line has 50 tension. This line has 50 tension. She only has to flow with 50. But remember, to make this go up to one meter, she has to pull two meters a line. So, I mean, that's the trade-off. You had to lift 40 centimeters to get it to come up 20. All right, now, we have the six. We have the, th the triple block here. Now, this is a 600 Newton block. There are 600 Newtons we want to lift. How many strands of rope are supporting the 600 Newtons? There are six. Now, it is one continuous rope. One, one, two, three, four, five, Six. Remember, these every line, every time it touches the pulley, every pulley you have has two lines touching it. Just like we were back here, right? One, two. Now we have three of them. There's six. Every time I add a sheet, a wheel to it, I get two more. Again, this one, not part of it because it's not a supporting line. It's only what touched the moving pulley. There are six lines supporting, which means, pardon? Well, there's one rope total, but we treat it as if it's six lines supporting. The way it runs, the, I mean, the physics of it, which means the tension of each strand is only going to be 100. 
right? Each one gets one sixth of that amount. So the man is holding a tension of 100 newtons, right? Because he's just holding the last line. So if he pulls down, but now if he pulls down 60 centimeters of rope, how far is it going to come up? 10. Right, my trade-off. I'm using one sixth the force, but I'm only going to raise it one sixth the distance. What is the mechanical advantage of this pulley system? Six, two, one. Now, remember, that's why I gave you the little pulley. The little pulley was just one little pulley. That was a two to one. Remember, all our machines in our lab had a two to one mechanical advantage. That's why they were set to a two to one mechanical advantage theoretical mechanical advantage. Now, if the guy does 60 joules of work, how much potential energy am I going to put into the box? He does 60 joules, he does 60 joules of work. How much goes into it? 10. Remember, work in equals work out. Energy does not change. I get less. That's real world, I'm going to get less. But in a perfect condition, right? 10, basically, if we were look to look at this, 10 times 600, 100 times 60, are they the same number? Actually, look, 0.6 times 100, 0.1 times 60, or times 600. They both equal 60 joules. Okay, they equal the same thing. That's why we have that trade-off. Work in equals work out. Okay, work. We're not talking force, we're talking work. Two different, totally different things, okay, on that. All right. So these are part of your notes. These are part of your notes. Very next time, test. Note cards. You bring in your note cards. You bring in your packet. Everything, all the scores filled in. Everything ready to go. You throw, walk in the room, you throw your packet. You know, when you get to class, it's not the time to put it together. You had time to put it together. It should be put together now. The only thing you need to add is this last little bit of notes on the back. If we can get that stapler back to the front, back to the side, please.